Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This afternoon, we have Newbury Court resident Mark Hopkins coming to talk about a trip he took back in 2008 to Honduras. Uh, the original talk that he has given before has focused more on uh, what this non-governmental organization has done to help this little village in Honduras. But just for us, he has uh, revamped the talk for, so that it will be much more timely uh, and address things that are going on in Honduras today and how they relate to uh, immigration in the United States. <clears throat> and uh, I think he will probably explain everything better than I can. So without further ado, I'm going to give you Mark Hopkins. Okay, well. <laughs> uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, how this came about uh, because it's, it's a little bit important. Um, I had no, a call from a dear old friend who's a doctor up in Norwich, Vermont, about uh, 11 years ago. And uh, he said, you know, we're doing all this good work down in, in Honduras, and we're having difficulty getting our story told. And he said, would you come down, spend a couple of weeks with one of our teams, and uh, bring your camera, and uh, then put together some kind of a slide presentation. So I leapt at the opportunity and spent uh, two weeks in this village that I'm going to tell you about, and then came back. And, and uh, from, from then on until now, um, they have been using uh, what I did as their, uh, uh, their storytelling for fundraising and for recruitment, because they recruit teams of doctors and dentists and uh, teachers from all over the country to go down there. Uh, until this week, this was kind of a promotional talk because it was to promote their, uh, their business. Uh, but this week, I've totally upended this talk and, and uh, changed it uh, to describe what's going on down there in the context of the things that we all hear about, which is the immigration situation. So this is a, a, a whole new talk for me. Um, those of you who have seen me give a talk, uh, I guess know that I don't... Uh, uh, use script or notes. Well, uh, in this case, I have to because it's scripted for other people to give, and so forgive me if I stumble here and there. So, um, do you want to uh, cut some uh, the lights and, and <coughs> get the lights down here to where they should be? Is that okay for everybody? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I want to tell you the story of a small farming village in Honduras and how a group of American volunteers helped it overcome the ravage of, ravages of poverty. Now, I know you all know exactly where Honduras is, but uh, somebody that I was talking to this week said, oh yeah, that's that small country down there between uh, Mexico and Argentina. <laughs> so so uh, let's just get oriented here so we're all in the same boat. Uh, Here's Central America, down through here, Panama. Here's the northern coast of uh, South America, Colombia and Venezuela. Here's Cuba up here. Here's Florida, so everybody see where we are. And here is Honduras, okay? Right up here is what they're now referring to as the Northern Triangle, which is Guatemala, Honduras, and uh, uh, El Salvador. Uh, and that's where all the immigration is coming from. But our story is about Honduras today. So this is a closer up uh, uh, picture of Honduras. Um, there are two major cities, Tegucigalpa down here, which is the capital, and San Pedro Sula up here, which is kind of the commercial center. And the rest of this is farm country, basically mountainous farm country. The only um, re um, uh, resort area up that is of any importance in Honduras is up here in uh, Roatan Island. So it's, it's, it's pro really, really tough country. And where we're going to go today is right here in the little village of El Rosario. When the American team made its first visit to El Rosario 33 years ago, they began their work in a village that was enduring many hardships owing to poverty. Life was a daily struggle. Disease and parasites abounded, and malnutrition was pervasive. The basic elements of sanitation were non-existent. Living was a hand-to-mouth proposition. Water had to be carried from, from nearby streams and springs in buckets. 
the only access to health care was many hard miles away. With simple dwellings like this housing families of six or more and entirely lacking water and sanitation, you can imagine what a struggle living was for these people. For the children especially, most everything was unavailable. Nutrition, medical or dental care, schooling, clothing, and even toys. And uh, believe it or not, uh, these little kids were, knew what they were doing with those machetes and they were sharp. They were the family's machetes. So life there was a really tough daily challenge. In 2002, after 16 years of work in El Rosario, the American team incorporated as a nonprofit called ACTS. Its stated mission is to assist the people of Honduras in health care and community development. ACTS is a, an acronym for Americans Caring, Teaching, Sharing. And it's run entirely uh, by volunteer effort, which means that every donated dollar goes to the Hondurans, either directly or as services that benefit them. Life in El Rosario today has undergone vast improvements that I'm going to talk about. And this is the story of its people, with help from ACTS uh, and how they achieved it. El Rosario's setting is a rugged mountainous in mountainous country. The village is reachable only by four-wheel drive vehicle by a half-hour trip up a winding dirt road. The village nestles in a small mountain valley and consists of about 90 families, or about roughly 500 people, spread across the valley. This is the upper village, and this is the lower village. In those days, there were no stores or public facilities other than a schoolhouse. When Axe arrived in 1986, they considered the dismal conditions and quickly concluded that two things required top priority. One was to build an on-premises medical clinic, and the other one was to establish a safe, convenient water supply for the entire village. Within two years, Axe had raised the money and manpower to build that clinic, which has been thriving ever since. It serves the area's residents' health care needs on a daily basis. And uh, you can see a rather sick young fellow here that en ended up going to the hospital with some terrible disease when I took that picture. The clinic is man was manned for many years by Nurse Rosa, a member of the community whose training was provided by Axe. The facility consists of a dispensary, exam and consultation rooms, a dental clinic, and a basic laboratory. Axe sends visiting medical or dental teams from the U.S. several times a year, serving the people both in the clinic and in the homes. Illnesses and treatments that are beyond the clinic's capability are transferred to a small hospital in the town of Yarrow, an hour's drive away. Uh, we made a, a, a visit to Euro while I was down there, and the doctors were complaining that there was no hot water in the hospital. That shows you the conditions that uh, they're dealing with down there. It's very, very primitive. In addition to clinical work, the t visiting teams put considerable effort into patient education, addressing concerns such as proper child care, nutrition, family planning, and personal hygiene. Axe's second major challenge was bringing a ready supply of clean water to the village. In the beginning, the entire village drew its water from this spring-fed well, which was shared by local livestock. With all that manure, you can imagine the potential for transmission of waterborne diseases. There was also this mountain brook, again shared by both animals and people. When getting your water means hoisting a bucket onto your head, and when you have to transport quantities of it over long distances every day, it's obvious that having a readily available source right at your home will bring huge benefits. So that was Act's second achievement in El Rosario, bringing in an abundant supply of clean water. Today, every home in the village has its own supply, available at the turn of a spigot. Now, I should mention at this point that Axe could not have been successful in El Rosario over the years without two very important strategic alliances. Axe's strength is in community development and health care. So for the engineering know-how required to build water and sanitation systems, it is partnered with Engineers Without Borders, a nonprofit group with chapters at many universities. The one they were tying into uh, here was at Northeastern University, which was bringing uh, undergraduates and graduates uh, down there uh, to do the work. To deal with farming and agricultural issues, AXE has teamed with Sustainable Harvest International, or SHI, 
American NGO that promotes sensible land use practices in all of Central America. Creating El, El, El Rosario's water system was, as you can imagine, a major undertaking. ACTS and EWB assembled volunteer teams to bring in large quantities of pipe and in coordination with the local people to do the necessary digging. The finished system transports fresh water from a source high in the hills down to this large concrete holding tank whose location above the village creates the pressure necessary to reach the people below. The final step was to create a distribution system which would deliver water to each home, which as you can imagine required much planning and digging. It took several years, but it got done. Today, most homes access their water from a tap in their yard, like this one. Some get a little fancier, bring it right up to the kitchen, where she's cleaning her chicken there. Others uh, send, had uh, set up laundry facilities uh, in their yards, while even others rig up tubs, showers, and other, inconven other conveniences, one of which you can see here being inspected by an AXE team. Today, things are so different in El Rosario, and nowhere do you see the change reflected better than in the faces of the people themselves, especially the children. They're a bright, good-natured lot, and they seem to be getting healthier, happier, and more energetic each year. In the El Rosario area, family is the cohesive unit for all of the people. It is the basic source of security and direction, and it provides whatever safety net it can for those in need. And while the bonds between generations are very strong, there is no evident political organization or leadership. The village has no chief, no hierarchy, no nominal leaders rising to the top. It's all about family. So AXA's biggest challenge has been to address community development with the realization that its work succeeds only when the people understand the reasons behind the changes it recommends and are motivated to take responsibility for them once initiated. So ACTS has worked closely with the people to establish several committees that have become a dynamic force in the community. The first is the clinic committee. This group of El Rosario villages does a marvelous job of managing the clinic's financial and logistic affairs. It also coordinates closely with each visiting ACT teams, as you can see happening here. This is my old buddy, Dean Siebert, who's uh, uh, been running this thing for the last uh, 25 years, and he's the one that uh, motivated me to come down and get involved. Uh, and, th and this is his daughter, uh, Kristen. Some of the uh, most important work uh, for the committee has been to devise ways of making the clinic self-supporting. They achieved that with their corn program, using these silos. Before each planting, the village farmers borrow money from the clinic to buy their seed. Uh, buying seeds, by the way, for in, in, in this poor climate is the biggest cash outlay uh, of the year uh, for the farmers. Afterwards, the farmers repay the debt with a portion of their harvest. The corn everyone contributes is stored here until it can be sold at the best market price, and the incoming money supports the clinic. In addition, Patients using its services pay a small charge, and the committee maintains a helping fund for those who cannot pay. A second more, a most important uh, group in El Rosario is the Health and Development Committee, which is responsible for overseeing the clinical outreach and public education. Discouraging scenes like this one are fortunately becoming much scarcer as the committee makes progress helping the people especially the children, understand how personal cleanliness and proper sanitation lead to a healthier, happier existence. And I have to tell you, every time I look at this picture, I wince. I, in, in case you're missing it, that's horse manure up here. This was in the road, on uh, the main road coming through. We had just had a rainstorm. This little kid had made a nice little dam here. And as far as I can see, he was eating the I mean, oh my god, I don't even like to look at it. A third, um, Let's see, where were we? Um, the third uh, committee, uh, this focuses on the operation of a library and education uh, center. Through the efforts of ACTS and the community, this building uh, was once a schoolhouse, has been converted into a library and classroom facility, serving the needs of villagers throughout the region. In recent years, they have added a computer workshop to help the younger members build marketable skills. 
One more group rounds out ACTS's uh, committees, the Education Committee. It's comprised of teachers from El Rosario and nearby villages, and its principal role is to help ACTS identify ways it can be of assistance. ACTS intermittently sends teams of American teachers there, and the interchange of methods and ideas has proven great value to both groups. El Rosario School is staffed by two local teachers, and every child is required to attend for the first six grades. Further education is optional. Limited funding for the school comes from the Honduran government, and I mean limited. Unfortunately, the availability of books, teaching aids, and other educational supplies is totally inadequate, and ACTS does what it can to fill the gap. Farming is the principal source of, of both food and income for the people of El Rosario. And ACTS has historically teamed up with Sustainable Harvest International, SHI, to work with villagers interested in improving their farm output. This photograph, taken after the corn harvest, shows just how raw and hard scrabble much of the arable land is. The farming challenges there are many. SHI has introduced many clever innovations to the local farmers, especially ideas that can be fulfilled with minimal financial investment. This is a typical example, a slow drip irrigation system for growing cabbages entirely made of scrap wood, string, and discarded soda bottles. Just like everywhere else in Central America, the dietary staples at El Rosario are corn and beans both of which are grown locally for food and as cash crops. Rice is the third staple, which does not grow in the area and must be purchased. Meat is a very minor part of the local diet. Except for chickens, animals are raised almost exclusively for market, not food. One of the uh, chaps that I got to know in, in, the, in the village, even though I don't speak Spanish, uh, we hit it off. And we were talking about this, and he, uh, he said, I don't eat cows. <laughs> Through SHI's work, not only have the villages improved crop yield, they have also learned new growing methods and ways of enriching the mix of what they grow. SHI has also helped them find new markets for their output, generating additional sources of income. An interesting, I love this one, an interesting agricultural innovation in the village is this methane generator. Readily available cow manure is shoveled into the long polyethylene tank where it decomposes and generates methane. The methane travels through the white pipe that you can see right under my friend Ronis and into his house into a two burner gas stove where it burns with a hot blue flame. Can you see it right here? Right? That's all it takes. There's plenty of fuel for every meal and no meter to run up the bill, it's free. All that's required is a willingness to shovel cow manure on an almost daily basis. Another example of local entrepreneurship is this first attempt uh, at fish farming. This is an ax team inspecting the progress of a local farmer's effort to grow tilapia in one of the neighboring villages. Now I mentioned previously that Axe's two principal priorities for El Rosario were building the clinic and, and uh, hand bringing in the water supply. Actually, there are two more, both having a major impact on the health of the community. One is latrines, and the other is cooking stoves with stovepipes. In the old days, the forest was the bathroom. Today, every family in El Rosario has its own latrine, and the people have been taught how proper sanitation and hand washing stops the otherwise endless cycle of infections and intestinal parasites. Axe pays for the latrine, which costs about $75. The owners dig the pit, cap it with concrete, build the structure, and contribute about 10% of the cost. The program has made a huge difference in the health of the population there. The introduction of closed system stoves has also had a major impact. Notice here, the smoke rising from this old cooking shed. There's an open fire inside, but no chimney. The smoke just seeps out through the roof and wall. That is the traditional way that they all did their cooking in their homes. In this family's home, you can see the soot accumulated on the wall and the roof. 
the family would be have their bed their living room and bedroom down here this is the kitchen area and this is a typical house in in uh, in, in that area just imagine the rep respiratory problems caused by the family's constant exposure to wood smoke and terrible accidents sometimes occur when children fall into the open fires the solution is this stove design that using cement can easily be made in the home at the front of the stove here, firewood is fed into the inner fire chamber. The cooking is done on the barrel top up here. That's a steel barrel top that comes in, uh, that they can get uh, commercially. And the opening on the left is a small oven. All the smoke disappears up the chimney. No more respiratory problems, no more burns. These stoves are efficient, safe, and low cost. Axe provides the design and materials. The owner builds the stove. Through its education efforts, these innovations have caught on widely throughout El Rosario and all of the adjoining uh, villages as people realize the benefits of it. So looking at El Rosario today, the differences from the old days are really striking. Interest in the community has grown. People are healthier, more energetic, more committed to education, more motivated to pursue a better future. Increasing number of animals populate the village. Did I miss one here? Wait a minute, let's go back. Whoop, there, there we go. Uh, increasing numbers of animals populate the village as cash revenue from livestock and crop sales brings money into the community, gradually building wealth and security. Very much like uh, so many of the uh, uh, villages in Africa, cattle are wealth. And where everybody once walked, horses are now more prevalent, as are bicycles and the occasional motorcycle or pickup truck. Machines are starting to replace hand labor, like this gasoline-operated grinder, which is used for grinding corn for tortillas. The benefits of a ready water supply are everywhere. Drying, chemical, drying laundry here signals the new awareness of the benefits of personal cleanliness. New houses go up frequently. For, the mo for, for most, the process starts by making one's own adobe brick from which the walls will be built. The adobe walls are raised and covered by tin roofing strips to protect them from rainstorms well, while they dry. Timbers for the roof structure are hand cut with chainsaws high in the forest and transported by ox cart. Can you imagine cutting these things with a chainsaw? But this is what these people are doing. <coughs> The roof covering of the, of the house will be sheet metal, essentially the only building supply that is purchased besides doors, windows, and concrete. Finally, the adobe brick is stuccoed and painted, and windows, windows and doors are installed. A house of this type can be built for around $1,000. One addition of the village not of Axe doing was the government's introduction of electricity in 2006. The full effect of this change is yet to be seen, but interestingly, with the exception of illumination radios, occasional TVs, and small refrigerators, plus, of course, cell phones and computers, electric power has not yet had much overall effect on El Rosario's lifestyle. Now, I mentioned before, AXE's primary focus has been on community development and concern for the greater good, but occasionally they encounter individuals with exceptional needs whose lives can be changed for the better. This is Lillian. Lillian is the victim of a tragic accident, but she's the energetic mother of four who is wheelchair-bound paraplegic. Lillian's story uh, was that uh, uh, her husband came home one day, uh, loaded to the gills, pulled out a gun, shot her in the back, and then killed himself in front of her and her four children. Really, a really tragic story, but she's a gutsy lady. And um, so Axe has raised funds to create a home environment that serves her needs for bathing laundry and personal independence, and also build her this sewing machine rigged with a special lever so she can activate it using her forehead. As a result, Lillian is not only able to take care of herself physically, she also supports herself running this tiny bodega, plus sewing for others and producing clothing and other items for sale. If you go in the, uh, uh, the uh, university store at Dartmouth, uh, you will see green sweaters, which probably were knitted by Lillian uh, uh, with her connections to, to Dartmouth. Carlos is another example of individuals whose lives have been changed. Despite his sunny disposition and perennial optimism, 
Carlos suffers from the consequences of childhood polio and that cost him the use of his legs. His only means of getting around is to push along using his right foot and his hands. Axe raised money to buy Carlos this horse and built this special saddle. And it worked with El Rosario committees and EWD to develop ways that Carlos can become more economically self-sufficient. There's a funny side story here. Uh, when the um, horse was first delivered to Carlos, uh, it was a stallion. And he was terrified of the horse because the horse bit him every opportunity it could possibly do. And so it was, it was kind of a, a, a standoff until one of the medical teams came down and one of the guys was a surgeon and he looked at the situation. He says, I can fix that in a damn hurry. So he went snip, snip, stitch, stitch, and the horse is no longer a stallion and uh, they are great friends. <laughs> so good things turn out well. Uh, an another person to receive special needs attention was a tiny baby born with severe birth defects in a very poor village nearby where Axe hadn't done any work when I was down there. Here you can see one of the medical teams arriving to check her out. This is Gloria when she was five months old. Her tiny extremities deformed by a rare debilitating condition called arthrogryposis, which uh, apparently in this case was a, a, owing to a paucity of amniotic fluid in the uterus during her development. Axis continued to provide Gloria's family with exercises, brace, and equipment like this rocker. This, unfortunately, is an indication that uh, not everything turns out to, for the best. The problem with little Gloria has been that her family is not a particularly responsible uh, uh, family, and the parents have not done what they were supposed to do with hers, which is a frustration to Axe, but you can't win them all. So here, here, here oh, sorry, there's the uh, other picture. I forgot about that. So here's a map of a region. Here's El Rosario in the middle. This is the main uh, east-west um, uh, highway in the north. La Habana is a town of, of uh, two houses. And then this is the um, ro dirt road that takes about a half an hour with four-wheel drive vehicle to get up to El Rosario. And these are a lot of the other villages uh, that, uh, owing to the success of El Rosario, they basically come in and said, can we get some too? And Axe has been able to... Uh, to uh, um, accommodate them. And there's also uh, these other villages that they're still working on. Uh, and um, I want to just take you to two villages in particular, Los Planes up here and El Carrizalito uh, down here, just to give you the, the flavor of the place. El Carrizalito is a little village perched on a mountaintop, and you can only get there either by horseback or on foot. It's very scenic, but everything must be carted up and down by hand, and the challenges are many. My back was killing me when I was down there, and so in order to go up to El Carrizalito, I was able to borrow this mule from, uh, that's me, by the way, in case you don't recognize me 10, 11 years ago. Uh, I was able to borrow this mule from uh, one of the villagers, and this was a chore. Uh, this mule's name is El Rapido. And I can guarantee you that name was delivered with much sarcasm. Here's how you rode El, El Rapido. You held this, uh, the brain with this hand, and you see it comes down here with a braid, and then it opens up here like a whip, and that's exactly what it is. And so to get started, you simply swung this thing and beat the bejesus out of the rear end of El Rapido, who would then start into a nice walk. And as, as soon as you stop beating his rear end, he went slower and slower and slower, and then he would stop. And you'd have to wail on him again. So we got up to El Carrizalito and back again on El, 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 El Rapido, but it was more work on my part than it was on his. So um, the uh, most difficult thing about El Carrizalito is its water source, which is about 200 feet below the village. It's located at this mountain spring where the animals also drink and the women do their laundry. Obviously, in this case, one can't use gravity to deliver the water supply. So the water comes up entirely by people power every day. These chock full buckets weigh about 40 pounds a piece, which makes for tough daily work. But they live contentedly in El Carrizalito and are willing to make the effort, hopeful that someday they'll get electric power up there to solve that problem. Now let's look at Las Planas. 
uh, which in earlier years presented acts with some of its biggest challenges. Unlike El Rosario, folks who are mis where, where the folks are mestizos or mixed, Amer Spani uh, mixed Amerindian and Spanish, the Los Planos people are of the Tolopani ethnic group and keep to themselves. This is the scene of their village schoolhouses one approaches through the forest. When an axe team first visited there, it found rampant poor health and malnutrition. Living conditions were awful, parasitic infections were widespread, and what's more, the village people were so wary of outsiders, they would flee into the forest when people came to visit. Um, I don't know how many of you have, uh, have seen the signs of malnutrition uh, when you travel, but, oh, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button here. This little boy down here, you can see that his hair is not shiny black the way theirs is. It's kind of off gray. That's a pure sign of, of malnutrition, as is the extended belly uh, down here. As you can see here, all that has changed. This is the welcoming committee headed for the schoolhouse where the clinics and education meetings are held. In just two years, the changes at Los Planos were enormous. Access to water, as in the other villages, was huge. In the beginning of Axe work there, this tiny spring was the entire village's water source. Every last bit of water the people used was hand carried from here to the homes and the school. In less than two years, EWB, with the support of Axe and the local people, brought water to nearly every house. Meanwhile, Axe visiting medical teams held periodic clinics here. Today, in the clinic waiting line, you can see how healthy the people look, but the work continues. Uh, you can also see the difference in the faces here, of the, the, the Tolopani people, which is very different than the physiognomy of the, uh, of the mestizos. Here is a welcoming team uh, instructing their, uh, their health and development committee on personal cleanliness, in this case, tooth care. This is my old friend, Dr. Dean. Uh, I gave him a hard time on this one. I said, what qualifies you to talk about dental when all you've got left is six teeth? But he's a, he's a wonderful guy. Uh, the lady in the sweater, by the way, is uh, a Honduran from San Pedro Sula who served as a translator for many years. This is one of the ex uh, Spanish speaking volunteers instructing the villagers about body lice, los pijos, pio, piojos. Always a big problem when personal hygiene is lacking. All the details get covered here how you contact them, how you contract them, what you do to get rid of them, and avoid catching them again. And here is a volunteer showing their leaders how to shave soap and prepare bottles of soapy water that will be hung next to the latrines to encourage hand washing. A surefire, no cost way to prevent these disease transmission. What is especially gratifying here was seeing how the more experienced El Rosario uh, committee members were committed to helping their Los Planos neighbors especially since members of the ethnic groups have been traditionally looked down and shunned, uh, looked down upon and shunned by the mestizos. That's the El Rosario uh, committee standing at the top and the Los Planos uh, committee uh, down below them. The personal dynamics with this relationship were really heartwarming. In 2000 and, uh, and, and 2009, ACTS launched its farthest reaching community initiative with the program recognizing that the future of El Rosario's region lies in the hands of its youth. The young people themselves named it, and I'll pardon my bad Spanish, La Fuerza para el Futuro, or the force of the future. And its goal is to marshal the collective energy of the region's teens and give them the tools and the sense of pride needed to assure the continued growth of a cohesive, robust community. The program has become po a popular annual event that brings together young people into an intensive, week-long workshop type setting. With ages ranging from 13 to 20 or more, they assemble each year in El Serio for homestays from the region's many outlying villages. These are the program's objectives. To provide an opportunity for turns, teens to learn the importance of community service, to introduce the skills that they need for successful community leadership, to develop a web of stresses is that this may be more than just a temper originating to go up through Mexico uh, into America. 
And this is what climatologists are now calling the dry corridor, which is where drought is becoming more common. This is all about climate change. And two other factors are compounding the problem, indiscriminate deforestation throughout the region and the current El Nino phenomenon. So when your maize crop looks like this, there is major cause for concern. As one of the El Rosario leaders, El Rosario leaders was heard to say this spring as he watched the corn turn brown, and this is a quote, we're looking at two choices here, either pray for rain or emigrate. Whether these drought conditions will prevail, nobody knows. But the prospect looks uncertain at best for the subsistence farmers of the region. So should the unthinkable happen, unthinkable happen and the people of El Rosario have to leave their lands, let me introduce you to some of the faces that could be headed north to America. These two guys were my favorites. I wish I spoke Spanish because I would have loved to get to know them better. Uh, Dionisio, uh, with a great sense of humor, creative, uh, a, a real village leader. Ronnie's very quiet, gentle guy. He's the guy I borrowed the uh, uh, El Rapido from. Uh, and here's some other people. Esther was uh, one of the school teachers in the village. Rita was a housewife. Doña Tica is one of the matriarchs of the village. Uh, she uh, loved to do laundry for the uh, t visiting teams when they came down. And boy, when she went at the laundry on those, what do you call those uh, uh, concrete washboards, uh, my old friend Dean Siebert uh, said one time, she, he said, she's the only laundress I've ever seen that could turn ankle socks into knee socks. <laughs> and then old Norman, uh, who was so poor that he had to sleep under a, a tarp in his living room because uh, he couldn't afford to fix the hole in his roof when it rained, but he was always smiling. And then the faces of the children. Handsome kids, happy kids. And so, folks, these are some of the faces that could be heading north if things don't get better down there. These are the murderers and the rapists and the MS-13s and the Islamic terrorists that we can expect to be banging on our borders. So be ready. And I will tell you this. I met a lot of people in Arisario, and there was not one person that I met that I would not be content to have them as a neighbor here in America. So that's the story up until now. There's more to it, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs>